Who's allowed to look? Three one C four in the rear. The ball and I asked them to wait there. We're at area of poisoning. But we are kicked out of here. Fighting still out of it again. That's the matter. I to name of war. The fat are all too severe. Think spare on the tall. Even me. Yeah. Hey, you see my poetry. I don't even have to say like fuck it right over here. Grab a microphone and make this quiet. Medium. Well, welcome and thank you for coming today. I apologize about the, the warmth in here. Um, I think we had a generator test this morning, and every time that happens, like the air conditioner shuts off or something. But I didn't notice that if you get too warm, you can walk out this door, and there's a pond right there you can jump in. Uh, no, they'll call you off for a little bit until you come back in. Was that the new world for right? This is. All right, well, I thought you didn't come here to hear my talk, so I'm going to introduce Carlos T. Kearns. Uh, Willow Creek Coins, the uh, Gibbs Protege let him um, talk about him, himself and all that good stuff. Who? All right, well, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Brian. Um, thanks very much for uh, your, your time this afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, just a little bit about myself. Uh, I've been uh, collecting coins since I was in high school. And uh, so it, I, I didn't do that in my day job uh, or my career. I was with the U.S. market bring service uh, for several years. You know, it's a record good in national trade if it's in Jersey for several years. Um, so uh, international trade has been uh, very much um, front and center. What, what I've been doing for the last 14 years, uh, I've uh, been more from the all coin collecting side of my life. And you know, I have been working in uh, both appraisers and acquisitions uh, since that time. And what I wanted to, to uh, say a little bit about uh, with respect to today, um, there, and a little bit about me. With, with respect to, to coin work, I've um, been a member of some years with the American and Hispanic Association. I'm currently serving as special advisor to the president of the AA, Tom Uron, who is from here in the Pittsburgh region, uh, member of the Pennsylvania Association, Nespotist, Tom was elected last year as a New York and a club and been a member of the Harris River Coin Club since I was at high school. Um, a little bit about what I've done. Um, what brings me to my topic today was a, 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 a um, exhibition that I curated last year uh, on the work of Augustus of Gaudens, which we're going to talk about today, um, and to, to coin the, the term of the arts of money. Uh, we curated the show at the National Arts Club in October of uh, 2023, um, and it's something that, that we'll reference again today. Uh, so what I wanted to, to be talk a little bit about is the, the presence of history in the, uh, in the minting points, uh, specifically how it, it then evolves into the coin design in the United States specifically the word of Augustus St. Gaudens, and the interplay between St. Gaudens and President Theodore Roosevelt, who was, was very active in, in Nevis Mattis. Coins throughout history have conveyed various themes, uh, whether it is uh, conveying a, a sense of sovereignty, a sense of authority, a uh, sense of faith, um, and these are the context of which coins have been communicating as a means of exchange for quite a number of years. Just a few examples. The uh, tetradrachma on the, uh, on the left dates from about 550 uh, BC, and it is um, Athena on the pair, the Alverse and the, um, the Owl of Wisdom on the reverse. To the right, uh, is an aureus of uh, Septimus Severus, uh, the Roman um, Caesar, the well, Roman emperor, uh, from the 200 AD uh, range. Here is a Sony of Constantus II uh, in, uh, in Constantinople, about 1150. Here is an example of um, 1592, this is a medal from Groningen in the Netherlands, uh, describing it, it was a victory medal, if you will, 
uh, concerning the siege of Groningen um, by uh, what at that point was the, the uh, ruler of the Netherlands, which was um, the, the Spanish crown. And uh, Groningen was very happy that they uh, managed to hold out against uh, the forces of the Spanish crown and uh, declared themselves a victorious uh, medal uh, concerning the, the history of the siege. So you're, you're seeing a story uh, of, of, again, whether it's power or authority or faith or politics, these themes resonate in coins throughout it, ever since their issue was. But notably, you can see the, the, the artwork um, that appears even from, from really earliest days of, of using these small disks to convey this message and to do so in an artistic fashion. Now there's something interesting that, that happened with respect to the creation of the arts, uh, the creation of the currency and coins of the United States. By 1789, 1790, uh, there was, uh, both here and in France, uh, an expression of wanting to use money not to express sovereignty, not to express authority, not to express faith, but going back to really ancient Greece to the theme of libertas, of liberty. And here you see the first uh, is, a, is a half dime, 1792, liberty looks kind of frightened uh, but she soon then evolves through Robert Scott uh, into the depiction of Libertas that we see here. And it, it is a thing that was unique. Uh, France was doing the same thing at the same time. Uh, we did not decapitate our leaders. We were, you know, okay to elect them democratically and pass uh, transition uh, rather peacefully. Um, and our French friends have since, you know, loved liberté, égalité, fraternité, but at the time, I think, who was really espousing some of the causes of the Libertas uh, was the United States. Uh, Seventy years on, Lincoln would make reference of a nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created. Uh, and we do have an, an example of the Libertas coin here uh, for um, all of us to view at the, at the end of the, uh, the presentation. So as, as the country develops, and we do have some very nice designs of coins, but, but the, the coinage of the United States for the first, um, for the most part, the first hundred years of its life, concerning simply the evocation of Libertas, um, the Eagle of Freedom, uh, and the espousing in both uh, the um, both peace leaves as well as as the arrows of defense. But from the beginning of the 20th century, we now move as a country, perhaps more mature, um, and experiencing uh, a renaissance of design in our coins. Several of these artists uh, of this late 19th century and beginning of the 20th century are people that some are, are very common names. Victor David Brenner is on the penny that we carry to this day. Um, Adolf Weinman, who was a student at uh, develops the, um, the uh, both the Standing Liberty half dollar, and was called the Mercury Dime, even though it's not Mercury. Um, Herman Atkins McNeil, uh, the uh, creation of the Standing Liberty Quarter, which we have an example, and Anthony De Franceschi, uh, who designed the Peace Dollar, uh, commemorating the end of World War One. Uh, Franceschi was De Franceschi was also a student of St. Gaudens and evocates his, uh, the, the use of the, of the victory, we'll see later, in the design of this coin as an homage to um, uh, to Spogs. And here we see, on, on the left, DeFranceschi's peace dollar, I'm sure you've all seen, 
out of Weinman's Walking Liberty Half Dollar, Ernie Atkins McNeil stand in Liberty and was sort of misnamed the Mercury Dime, had in fact a still Liberty um, with just got interesting interest. Now, something that all of these men and women had in common um, was uh, the National Arts Club in New York, which had been founded by Congress at roughly the same time. Um, all of these artists were either members or were honored by the National Arts Club in New York. So it's an interesting time where truly our artists are being sought out and commissioned to create the coins of the United States. And there's a National Arts Club uh, on Gramercy Park in New York, that's 20th and Park. Of uh, that, I have to make it a plug, and I was elected there in 1996. Very fond of the place. President Theodore Roosevelt, um, probably more than any other U.S. president, certainly at that time, perhaps since, was very interested uh, in the coinage of the country representing the aspirations of the country. And he specifically uh, commissioned Augustus Sitgaugus uh, to create designs for the largest coins then in circulation for our country, the $20 gold piece and the $10 gold piece. And Theodore Roosevelt and Augustus St. Thomas. Interestingly enough, uh, Teddy Roosevelt was born on 20th Street, about a three blocks from the National Arts Club. Augustus St. Gog's father was a shoemaker and who sold shoes to the family of Theodore Roosevelt. So it was all sort of in the mood, over the end. Augustus St. Gog's was born in, in Dublin of, uh, of uh, Irish and French heritage, but moved to New York early in his life and really considered himself a New Yorker and, and very proud parent. Um, certainly a uh, representative of the Boas movement in the United States in the latter half of the 19th century, we begin the 20th, um, and who embodied the ideals of the American Renaissance. Uh, the first of, of many commissions, of the first of all, he did, he did study in Paris at the Ecole de Bozon, uh, and certainly had a, a great influence of, of uh, French artists uh, in his work, both uh, Medalla work and, um, uh, and other medium of art. His first commission was a statue of Admiral David Farragut, a Civil War hero that uh, appears to this day in, in Madison Square Park in New York. And here is Admiral Farragut. So this was, this was about the first commission that Augustus of Bogus does. And he's known for, for this work. As a matter of fact, uh, you can see an example of his work at Shemlick Park. Um, so he, he does have work even right here that, that we can look at. Some of the more uh, representative work that he's done that, that has been noted over the years, uh, the, the statue of Diana that was on Madison Square Garden, first iteration of, of Madison Square Garden. Uh, the statue of Lincoln in Lincoln Park in Chicago, widely viewed as perhaps one of the finest uh, on the Barrington statuary in the country. Uh, and the monument to General William Tecumseh Shirt in Central Park, uh, where we will, which later will find its way into the design of the $20 gold piece. So Diana on the left, that's now at the Museum of, uh, uh, the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Uh, the statue of Lincoln in Lincoln Park to this day. And to the right, we see William Tecumseh Sherman and the Angel of Victory. Or here before the victory. This is the first representation of the work which we will see on this card. Um, Roosevelt was very again, representative of the aspirational nature of our country at the time, Mike Moran, in, in a noted author on uh, the work of, of St. Gaudens, records the, the, the words that, that Roosevelt used in his, um, in his presidential campaign 
of a republic ever brightened by the rays of the morning. Uh, the president looks. Fit in. Now, I think we're better. Sorry about that. Um, the president uh, engages at times at Diplomatic or Seppi in 1905. And, and Roosevelt, I think, had already decided what he wanted. He just needed him to do the work. The next day, starts sending notes to St. Gaudens about how do we design these coins. Uh, he, he would like representatives of, representatives of, of classical um, design and statuary uh, to appear on the coins of our country and to be it further emulate what he believed to be the, 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 the mood of the nation and the spirit of the nation. And so we see from the victory in Central Park to the $20 gold piece in high relief, and I have examples of both here. The high relief appears, as you can see, almost as a mountain. Uh, it is, uh, takes incredible strikes in order to get a, a full design out of that coin, and that's what led the coin to need to be redesigned. You can see the victory to the victory, and the rays of the morning that Roosevelt writes about. Uh, again, the coin is struck originally as if it were about. Uh, Roosevelt loves the design. He loves having this, this uh, evocative uh, piece representative of the country. Um, but um, the chief engraver of the Mint had to convince him to tone it down uh, because it, it was not able to be minted uh, very efficiently at all. The dies kept breaking uh, because they had to strike this coin so often in order to get to raise the up the high devices of the, uh, of the release. And so you can see it's still a beautiful coin, and, we, and, and we, I have a copy of the revised uh, $20 roll piece uh, that then gets released for, for circulation uh, by uh, later in 1907. While he was looking and working with St. Gaudens to talk about the design for the $20 gold piece, he was also very interested in the design for the $10 gold piece. Um, and he, he asked St. Gaudens, first of all, to develop a, a medal for his inauguration as, as president. He, as he now succeeded to the presidency when uh, William McKinley sadly was assassinated, then ran in his own right, uh, was elected. So, when it saw what the what inaugural medal the mint had made for him, um, he said no. Um, so we went, he went out to St. Gaudens and said, well, why don't you make him one? And so St. Gaudens then uh, executes a design for this inaugural medal for, um, for Teddy Roosevelt. And so you see on top is Roosevelt's medal. It's a beautiful medal. Um, it wasn't the official one, but that's the one he gave out. And you can see that the, that the eagle, almost a, com a complete transfer from the inaugural medal to the $10 gold piece. The other point that Roosevelt was very keen about was to have a Native American expression of our money. It had happened once before. In 1859, uh, the Indian head penny was released, and so the first time uh, that, that a Native American is expressed in our form. But, but Roosevelt was very key to have a Native American uh, de depicted uh, on, the, on the coins of the round. Uh, that, that, that succeeds also in the uh, design of the Buffalo Nickel. The $20 gold piece is generally considered to be the, uh, perhaps the finest work uh, that we have ever done um, with respect to United States coins. Uh, you know, again, subject to, to interpretation and, and, and design, the Walking Liberty Half, I've always thought was an extraordinary piece 
and and uh, and and uh, which we have a copy we can look at. Um, both pieces were were minted between 1907 and 1933, when President Roosevelt asked us all to give them in. Many of us didn't, but we were, we were asked that that we had to bring them in because we were we were uh, still on the gold standard of looking to stabilize our country a little a little bit. Uh, there was an exception where people were allowed to keep their gold coins if, if they were coin collectors. And so a whole army of coin collectors was, was instantly created in the country. Uh, and we're very grateful to them because that's why we can still collect them. Um, so in, in fact, you know, the, the, uh, we, were, we were gifted at that time to have some incredible artists uh, who were engaged by our political leadership to create the coinage of the country and, and we really were able to, to uh, get the best of our, of our men and women artists who were able to, uh, to work and design our coins. And so we're, I think we're terrifically grateful that we had these men and women and their dedication uh, to creating the, the, our, our national light. Um, and I, again, I'll be here today and tomorrow if you have some coins that you're interested in, add praise to it. Uh, I think he's uh, farting with. Um, I'm very happy to take a look at it. Um, I'm also very happy to, to take questions. If anybody has any comments or questions concerning these coins, anybody else's coins. Which one, sir? Yeah, I'm cut up the, the collection, quite the name of the uh, sound. One in the Chris. Many coke, they both care. You get it coins. Um, like the uh, centennial uh, metal or any of those special metals that the, uh, the mint uh, puts out, or are they worth, are they worth collecting? Okay, the, the, you know, the question is about, um, you know, the U.S. Mint, uh, you know, routinely restrikes and issues metals, which are beautiful work. There's, there, there's some very substantial work going on. But with respect to the two, to the centennial or, or bicentennial metals, um, if the metals were struck in silver, there's certainly uh, intrinsic value to them. Um, uh, some, of the, some of the metals were struck in gold as well, so that, those metals will always have intrinsic value. But I think what the Mint is doing in that, is that instance, or quite frankly, is, is trying to make their artwork available to broad an audience as possible. So it's an idea to more to express the art than something that, that could uh, be considered to be of an investment. Uh, Fallen. Thank you, sir. Richard. Fallen. Well, um, for one of the apps, they will lead here. Fallen. Okay. Uh, Glad we saw them uh, on the radio. Be here this ad. Pretty much all the time. Uh, the name of a radio station, you of course. And uh, man, they're just discovered all of these particular uh, the coins. And you gotta hurry them in order and then more than you're doing it over some, like, and it's just maybe not on the option up and up, but they're gonna be reading with that kind of banana or the, the, that kind of a, a situation. You know, I, I think, Richard, there's a little bit of caveat on Amtor there. Uh, they, 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 might have, they might have discovered it 20 minutes ago uh, when they were creating the ad. Uh, but, um, there have been times during the, during the course of the last maybe 30 years uh, where either the, either the government itself uh, in what's over 30 years now. In the 1970s, the government had quite a collection of silver dollars specifically for Carson City, which they released in packaging uh, that were totally legitimate and, and were offered to anyone in the United States that could, you know, were up to five of them and, at the very at, at the start, it was by um, by lottery that that uh, you could draw in, that you could purchase one of these coins. More or less since that time, since the 1970s, the Treasury uh, pretty much finished selling off what silver dollars they still had. That was the last, really, of the government's stockpile. Occasionally, you will see collections of half dollars or dollars that have been in private hands for some time uh, and are released, okay? 
And, and that still happens, but in much smaller quantities and not very often. Those are generally well curated, well marketed through responsible dealers that do not use radio or television to advertise the coins that they are trying to sell. I would absolutely commend Numismatic News, Holy World. Uh, there are legitimate publications that come out every week or month. The Numismatist, which is a monthly publication. The American Numismatic Association. Uh, all of those have reference to um, uh, to literature on the subject, to larger collections that are being sold. We give you an indication of price. Bison? Thank you. I'm, I'm curious, what is it that you look for when they're appraising points? What are the parameters? Okay, thanks. The, in, in, Making an, an acquisition, what what I ask people to look for, please, are are any coins minted in 1964 or before, with respect to dimes, quarters, half dollars, dollars. Between 1965 and 1970, the Kennedy half dollar continued to be minted in silver, 40 percent. So as a barometer, if you, if you have 1964 and before, you have something of value. If you have Kennedy half dollars from 1965 to 1970, you have value. So those are normally what I ask people to uh, perhaps segregate out if they're interested in, in uh, selling their collection or, or have an idea of it's in this movie. Well, him too. And the lady rep. Is it true that uh, Henny has more copper in it? It's worth more than Penny? It is, and the United States government will allow you to melt it. <laughs> and here's another one for you. There's more than a nickel in a nickel. Okay. And as I say, that we've been trying for a long time to figure out as a country, hey, you know, we're, we're losing money on the penny and we're losing money on the nickel, uh, but we're, we're, we're just not able to move that yet. Uh, but all of our other countries are, have long since abandoned those, you know, those penny level and nickel level coins for that reason. But the, 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 you know, the government's wise on us uh, and pass legislation forbids us to melt. Meets right here. We've been talking about um, American coins. What about European coins? My sister lived in Europe for like 10 years. I have her collection of stuff. Where would I go to find the value of that? Okay, um, the question on European coins. Again, for the most part, you need to look about when that country uh, was still using silver in the coinage of their, of their country, a couple of parameters. Uh, Canada until 1967, um, Britain um, 1947, um, uh, Switzerland mm, 1962, 1963. So as a, as a, as a general barometer, if, you, if you're looking at material prior to those years, chances are at least some of them would be silver. And that's where you would derive your value. Okay. With respect to, to those coins uh, that are copper nickel that were minted in countries where you might have, have worked, I routinely work with the young numismatists of the Pennsylvania Association of Numismatists uh, and the Harrisburg Coin Club. And when when I'm you know working with an estate that has a lot of those coins, um, what I do is is donate them. Uh, to the Young Demisvitches program because they serve a very important value in determining the history of a country. 
So there is value to them, not financially, not intrinsically, but historically. And so we're able to, to educate a lot of our young people as to the history of nations using sports. I had to make The other preference? So what's the value that if so big as well as about this is the value silver lies of the like the Walking Liberty half dollars to them. Okay. So a, a a basic again, a basic barometer uh, of of the half dollar or or the quarter or the guy is is roughly about ten to one or or so, you know, depending on the fluctuation of the market. So, you know, but there's two half dollars. Instead of a dollar, it's ten dollars or ten dimes, four quarters. Uh, that's a that's a gel, you know, good mark to start with in terms of that. I did, I did understand your reason worth. Yeah. Okay, so if you have two half dollars uh nineteen sixty four or before four quarters or 10 dimes, for every dollar of face value that you have, I put a, a marker of 10 times that value. Okay. So that the nice thing that when I'm working with folks is that if they have that, just remember that, you know, that, that came into your pocket for, you know, for a buck, you know, two half dollars or four quarters. So, and at any rate, I mean, that's a, as a de minimis, you know, and, and depending on where silver so goes in the future, would be more. I mean. What is the value of an ounce of silver today? So, uh, I could go to my, to my handy CNBC. Um, the silver, the silver, it, it tends in a trading range right now between, you know, 20 to $22 an ounce, okay? Um, gold has, has had a more substantial rise in the last year um, versus silver. So uh, gold, gold really is uh, not dollar weighted, but but um, in in current um, terms, is really at about an all time high in terms of its um, of its daily trading range. Okay, so uh, sort of a spotlighted history is 1980. Um, gold went to eight hundred dollars an ounce in 1980 dollars. Um, so, if if you if you do the the, the math of the inflation and so forth, that would actually equate to about thirty two hundred dollars an ounce. Nineteen eighty was a pretty special year, as you know, um, and there was also an attempt to core in the silver market uh, that that year with the Nelson's bunker hunt uh, that saw silver go to fifty dollars an ounce again. Uh, $50 in 19 and 2024 dollars, you know, would be something outrageous, like 125 or 130 dollars an ounce. Okay, so uh, we might wait a long time till we test those highs, but but uh, it would be, you know, for the moment, um, you know, gold at you know over two thousand dollars an ounce, that's as high as it's ever gone in 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 about we have in in actual real-time value uh, as it ever has. And so I, I, I'm, I'm reluctant to give advice, um, but if, if you're holding on to gold, now it's not a bad time to let go at and anyone to sit. Um, do we took any other questions? If not, and I'm here, Please come forward and take a look at these coins and enjoy the art. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlos. Um, all quick announcement. He's man. Although it's on here today, he's lectures to want to take a look at. Um, you all speak here tomorrow. We do have a sign up sheet. 
um, on that wake up board. So if you're sitting on back tomorrow, please take the time um, to not see Carlos and we'll say, go ahead, go bar. Between 10 and 12. And then bro. Yeah, so we have different half an hour sign-up slots. So Nare comes at once. Where could bro be fun being here? Uh, he'll be in the game room. Thank you. Well, I'll find my way. Thank you, Pete. You already passed on down. Okay, great. That's that, great. On Francis. Look at some coins. He goes. I think we'll all get rid of this. Thank you, that's good. We can get out of bounds. Well, I'll see. 